I have the cutest free applique pattern for you. Whether it's Valentine's Day or not, I think any day that sewing a donut and cup of coffee applique is a good day. So let's get started. You're going to need your basic raw edge applique tools and supplies for this project. I've got a variety of fabrics from my stash that I'll be using. You'll need some type of fusible web. There are several brands that I use. Today I'm going to work with Heat and Bond Light. There are a lot of great fusible webs out. I will list some other options in the description. You'll also need a pencil, various scissors, Usually I like to use larger scissors for the larger sections I'm cutting. And then I have two smaller applique scissors that I'll tell you more about in a little bit that I really love to use. You're also going to need an iron and a pressing surface. And then of course you need your pattern. Depending on the pattern that you're using for your applique, the image or any wording may need to be mirrored with applique. Your original design that you're printing is not the final design. The final design will be a mirror image of that. So in this case, the donut will be on this side and the coffee on this side. So if you're using an applique pattern, the designer will most likely tell you whether or not you need to rotate it or if it already is. If you're using another type of file or perhaps free clip art online, you will probably need to make that change yourself. Most of the time it won't matter unless you have a preference of the sides that you want something on or a general direction. You could have an animal facing one direction and you decide you want them facing a different one. That might matter. The most important time for something like that is when you have letters of the alphabet because my logo is here just for copyright sake not to print in the applique but just to use it as an example you can see that the reverse of that all of the letters would be facing the wrong direction so what you want to do is print your original pattern in the mirror image so that when you applique and you have the opposite side, then it's facing the right direction. So I have all my supplies, so let's get going. The first and probably most important step of applique for me is the planning process. And I encourage you not to skip this process. Depending on your type of design, now if it's just one piece of fabric, then not a lot of planning needs to happen. But in patterns where you have fabric overlaid another section or particular design elements, you may want to think about those and plan those ahead of time to save yourself any trouble in later steps. So for example, I know that I want my donut to have a contrasting fabric where this icing really stands out. So when I was going through my stash, I knew I wanted the donut brown for chocolate, but then what would stand out? So I found this really pretty pink mauve and so I know when I trace my donut, I'm going to trace the entire area, even though there's going to be other parts of it that are either covered up or cut. My icing will be cut only from my pattern of the icing itself and the hole. But when I do my applique, I'll be laying those on top of one another. So that's something I need to remember. This is going to be a larger area fabric. And then also it will be in the background. This will be the foreground and I'll need less of it. I'll go through my entire pattern, decide what colors I want, how I will lay everything out and then we can get ready for tracing. The next step is to trace our pattern onto our fusible web. We want to make sure that you're using a paper backed fusible web so that you can trace your design onto the paper side. And then in, with heat and bond, the opposite side is the glue and you can see that shiny area there. The other side is the paper. There are some brands that are double-sided paper and that's perfectly fine as well. Make sure that you read your manufacturer's instructions on both how to trace your design onto the pattern and then also the proper time and temperature to use when fusing your fabric. At this point, what we want to do is begin tracing our pieces. I like to use pencils so that in case I do get outside of the lines, then I can just erase it with a pencil. You can also use any type of pen as long as it doesn't smear and not affected by heat. And if for some reason you can't see your design 
through your feasible web, you can always take a Sharpie or any other type of marker and make these lines darker. Now let's get started tracing onto our fusible. I mentioned before about planning. And so in that planning, I mentioned that I will do my donut one color, my icing another color, and then I will do the coffee cup, the heart, the cup, and then the coffee separately. Because I've identified that I want those on separate layers and with separate fabrics, we need to make sure that we are tracing them separately as well. So if I begin with the donut, another tip for you, you wanna make sure that you leave at least a quarter of an inch in between your shapes when you're cutting. So make sure that you do that in the tracing process as well. So here is the main section of my donut. And then I know that I need to cut the center of that donut. And then we'll move the fusible over, again, leaving a quarter of an inch in between. And position that to make sure that you're saving as much fusible as you can, but then also leaving yourself room to cut. Now I'm going to trace my icing. And I mentioned why I use a pencil, then you can erase and retrace if you mess up. And then we know we need to cut the center out of our icing as well. And I'm going to go ahead and trace my larger pieces first, and then I'll squeeze in the smaller pieces. Even though they're separately drawn, I think I'm going to go ahead and outline the entire coffee cup, then that way I don't have to worry about piecing small pieces together. And then again, when I think about my planning and layout, the coffee cup will be separate. I need the entire coffee cup. The contents of the coffee cup will be separate. When I lay that on top of the back of the coffee cup, then you'll be able to see the back lip area of the coffee cup, so I don't have to cut that separately. Layering of the pieces will take care of that look for me. And then also as you're tracing your pieces, it's a good time to go ahead and label anything that you need to label. So, in this case with my feet and arms later on that's just going to look like a circle and I'm not going to remember where that goes so I'm just going to label that with a C for coffee cup and then that is his right hand so I'm just going to put an R and I'll remember that same thing for the foot this is the coffee cups right foot coffee cups left foot and then if you need to also make yourself notes for fabric choices or anything like that then now is a great time to do that while you're tracing. And this is their hands together. I'm just going to put an H. And then this is the donut's right foot. And the donut's left foot. Which after we start laying out, we'll know which direction those are. I'm just making myself a note there. But to remember which pieces belong on which section is the most important. And that's my donuts left hand. Okay, so now you can see we have all of our pieces traced. And so the, now the next step will be to rough cut these pieces. And I just use my scissors and make a rough cut. Now at this point, we don't need to make any precise cuts on our fusible because we want to make sure that when we're fusing this to our fabric, we leave enough room around the edges to make sure that it adheres. And then I also like to cut off any excess fusible because that's just wasting fabric. And then just moving on with the remainder of my pieces.
Now one tip for you when tracing and cutting, if you know that you're going to be using one piece of fabric for several elements, then trace those all in one area and then that way you don't need to separate them before you fuse them. You could literally just lay this on top of your fabric and fuse this entire section, then cut all of the elements out separately. I didn't really have this with anything except for the hands of my characters. So I will do those out of the same material. But if you have larger pieces, just make sure that you trace them in a in the general same area so that you can just cut the larger piece. Now that all of my pieces are cut, I'm going to go ahead and get my fabrics and start organizing myself to fuse to my fabric. You'll want to make sure that you iron any fabrics before you fuse to those fabrics because if you have a wrinkled piece of fabric, then when you fuse to that, it will stay wrinkled and then the wrinkles will just be fused together as well. So we don't want that. Now, remember we said we wanted the brown for the outside of our donut and then the icing and the pink. And I like to lay those together and organize everything. I've got, um, I think I'm going to use this color for the background and then maybe my coffee cup and then the heart. And I like to lay things out like this. I will usually do this in the beginning as well so that I know that I have enough contrast between whatever background I'm using and between my different colors. So I should be able to use this for my cup. This is my actual coffee that I will probably cut out of this brown section. And then I have my heart, which I will use the floral fabric for. And then I have this with the dots that I'm going to use for my hands and feet, which you can see will be a nice contrast with that. And then I may also use this for binding if I decide to make a pillow with this. Now we're going to go ahead and iron our fabric and fuse our pieces. Here I am at my ironing board and I've cut down my fabric so that it's less to deal with over here. And I have this one piece of fabric that looks like it needs a little bit of a press before we get started. And I may just do that as I go. We're going to be gluing the glue to the wrong side of our fabric and then fusing from here. And I'll remind you again to check your manufacturer's instructions on the length of time and method you'll need to use to fuse your fabrics. Some recommend steam, some recommend dry irons, and then the seconds that you need to hold it as well. So my first piece of fabric, I'm gonna flip that to the wrong side, and then I had my donut and my coffee. So I made sure to cut the fabric big enough to be able to fit both of those pieces. And then when you are fusing your fusible to your fabric, do not iron back and forth. We want to make sure that we're just pressing the iron down. That's because we don't want these pieces moving or our fabric shifting. So you'll just hold it down for the amount of time the manufacturer suggests and then pick it up. With a larger piece like this, if I can't get my entire iron on it, then I'll press down and then pick the iron up and then press it down again. Do not iron it back and forth. And then also be careful when you are ironing near other areas that have already been fused, because if you fuse too long, it can actually melt the glue. So longer is not better with applique. And then when I'm done, I simply pick up the fabric and I can tell whether or not there are any areas that have not been fused properly. I don't need to pick or anything like that, just holding the fabric up to see and everything looks fused nicely so we can move on to our next piece. Okay, now I'm ready to cut my applique pieces from the fabric. I have the scissors that I've been using. I just designate these as my applique scissors so that I can cut both fabric and paper with them. And then I like 
I have two pairs of scissors that I like. One pair are from Karen K. Buckley, and these are six inch applique scissors, and you can see they have a nice pointy end on the top. And then these are Olfa five inch scissors, and again, they have a nice point for getting in some of the tight places that we need to trim with applique. Initially, we did a rough cut. Now we're going to do the more precise cut. This is where you'll do things like cutting out small little areas, like I have that area and then the area um, in my donut. Those center cuts will need to be made. We want to get the cuts as nice as we can around because that will be the final cut that we'll be making with our applique. So just go ahead and get started. For larger areas, I like to use my bigger scissors. I think it's easier on my hands than using the smaller scissors. So typically I'll just use the smaller scissors when I need to get in more tight areas. And periodically as I'm making those cuts, I'll turn it over and see what it looks like. I think it's easier to identify areas where you need to trim than just looking from the applique. So I will frequently turn it over and see how everything is looking. And you'll wanna make sure that you're not over handling the edges of your applique pieces at this point because these will start to fray and we don't wanna cause any unnecessary fraying at this point. One tip for you when you need to cut a center a center area out of a block is to just make a fold and then snip that fold and then you can begin cutting from that area makes things much easier and then again you're not over handling any of your fabric All of my applique pieces are cut and they are ready for the next step. Now, you'll need to think about what type of background you want for your project and what you're going to be making in your project. I am going to make a small pillow, so I'll prepare my background fabric and then I'll show you how we can lay everything out. I'm going to be making a small pillow with my applique shape. So I have cut a square that's 14 and a half inches. And at this point you would, you ideally want to lay out your applique pieces on something that you can press. I have a wool mat down here to protect my work surface. If you can lay everything out on your pressing station, that would be even better. Before I do that, I like to go ahead and remove the paper on the back of the applique pieces. One word of advice, when you are trying to remove your paper backing, sometimes it does not separate as easily and you don't want to pick at the edges because then you're going to be encouraging more fraying. So what I like to do is use a sewing pen. I like to use a thicker one than what I usually sew with and just simply score the back of the paper and then you can peel from that area. So I'm gonna get all these pieces peeled off and then we'll start laying everything out. Now with my smaller pieces, remember I wrote on the back of them indicating where they belong. So I'm not gonna remove the paper from them just yet. I will remove the H, which was the hands in the middle. I'll go ahead and remove that section. The other ones I'm going to go ahead and leave on and I'll remove the paper before I fuse it to the back. Because they're smaller pieces, I'm gonna put them to the side for now. And now we wanna begin laying out our pieces, but we need to find the middle 
of our fabric and then measure to make sure that we are centering our design the best that we can. And then also you want to make sure that you're leaving room on your edges to finish your project. In my case, since I'm making a pillow, then I'll wanna make sure I leave at least a half of an inch on all sides. And I don't wanna applique in those areas. So to find your fabric, you wanna fold it in half and just give it a little light crease and then fold it in half again. And then this area will be our center. And I like to just press that real tight with my fingers. If you need to, you can also use your iron and just lightly tap in that area. And now you see we can see the center of my fabric and I haven't had to mark anything. So now we will use both the center and the center horizontal line to help lay out our pieces. And I also have a ruler that we'll be able to use as well. Okay, let's start laying out our pieces. You can use your original pattern for reference if you need to. And I like to look at where the elements need to be lined up. So their bodies are different sizes, so I wouldn't necessarily want to center there, but their feet are along the bottom. So that's essentially where I wanna start and be able to build my way up. But I do need some scale. So what I like to do is take my bottom largest pieces and get them arranged nicely first. I know that with this design, I need to line up my feet along the bottom someplace, but then I also wanna make sure that they're not too far, too far down in this direction because then I'll end up with too much area above. I will be stitching the arms on, so I want to make sure that I leave enough room for that as well. So I just like to use those pressed horizontal and vertical lines. And then also remember I have this center section for their hands. And I wanna make sure that I'm leaving enough room for that as well. That's why we can use this as a guide. So I know I want my feet to be in this general area. So I have my donut feet and my coffee feet. And then put their hands to the side. So if I just laid those out, Again, I can remove the paper and fuse those separately after a while. I don't need to do that right now. And then I just begin playing with the layout until I'm satisfied with it. And remember, at this point, we haven't fused anything down. Even if you're using a double-sided fusible where it's sticky on the reverse, you can still just simply place your pieces on your background until you're happy. It's never too late to make changes until you fuse, keep that in mind. So play with everything, get your layout right, and then we'll talk about how to fuse everything together. Okay, and I've used my ruler to get a gauge and even out where my feet will be. And I think this is a good place for my donut and then for my cup. I know that I will be stitching their arms out to meet, similar to in the pattern. So I know that I want their little hands along the middle line, but just farther down here enough where I can stitch their arms out. And I'll show you how I do that. I actually will trace the line where I need to sew. So I think this is good for these pieces. In the beginning, remember I mentioned the different layers to some pieces, and this is where this comes into practice. And we begin laying the pieces on top of one another to create that layered effect. And there we go. And I think I am happy with that layout. Everything looks good. I am going to wait to fuse the little hands that go off to the side because they're not a part of this main design. I can lay those out separately. So, so at this point, now that I'm happy with everything, one of the reasons I mentioned that you should lay everything out on the surface that you can press on is now we don't have to move this or transport this. I can just fuse it directly on it. Or because I have this on a wool mat, I could pick it up and move it. But we wanna try to eliminate moving anything to disturb the pieces. And again, using my manufacturer's directions, I'll go ahead and start fusing these pieces. Again, making sure that I just lay the iron down and press, do not move back and forth. If there's some areas where I'm a little worried that they may move, 
I might just put the iron down for a second or two just to tack everything down and then go back over the areas and hold it per my directions. And now I'm left with my two hands that come off of these areas. I wanted to fuse the rest of the design down first before I did my hands. And that was just so that I could get a better visualization in case anything moved or shifted. And then just position those and fuse them. And now I have all my pieces fused and my project is ready to finish. At this point, you would wanna decide how you want to finish the edges of your applique pieces. You can use a satin stitch, a blanket stitch, any type of decorative stitch, or you can do some type of free motion or straight line quilting around, which is what I will be doing. I'm also going to show you how I draw on legs and arms with stitches rather than using the applique pieces. I don't feel as comfortable free motion stitching the arms and legs on my pieces. So what I'm going to do is use a friction pen and draw them there and then stitch over them. So I'm gonna go ahead and just lightly draw my arms and legs for me to stitch on later. Okay, so my arms and legs are drawn on and now everything is ready for finishing and stitching. Now I have my project at my sewing machine and because I'm making a quilted pillow, I've got my background fabric, a piece of batting, and then a piece of muslin um, underneath that. And as I mentioned, I will be free motion stitching around all of my edges. I like to do this with black, 40 weight or a fill thread. I think it gives it a fun modern look as well. You also can, as I mentioned, use a blanket stitch, satin stitch, even a zigzag stitch to secure your pieces. Essentially, we are just making sure that we're tacking down all of the edges. In the case of a wall hanging or something that won't get very much use or um, a lot of touching, you don't even technically have to secure your fusible edges. If you wanted to leave them without any stitching, you most definitely could do that. And then also when thinking about quilting the background fabric, that is again up to you. One idea that I did have, and then to be honest, I completely forgot before I started the video, I was actually going to quilt the background before I laid my applique pieces. I've done that before and it gives it a fun look. You can quilt it afterwards all over. In some of my projects, because they're smaller, I will still stitch my pieces down individually and then do some type of quilting on the background and then just call it a day because I want the attention to be on the applique pieces. So really this is your project, have fun with it and stitch as you'd like. So to fuse my pieces with a free motion technique, I'm using my open toe foot and I will just outline all of my raw edges. Typically I will go over the area twice. It gives it a thicker look and a much better outline. But what I love about this technique is that it just gives you the creative freedom to have fun with it. It doesn't have to be perfect. The lines won't be perfect. Sometimes my lines are so crooked and when I go back over it, I don't exactly go back over it and that's okay. This is your fun project.
Okay, and now I have finished stitching all of my applique edges and my arms and legs. So essentially I am finished. As I mentioned, if I wanted to do some background quilting, I could do that as well, but I'm actually going to leave my pillow just like this. So I'm gonna finish off my pillow project and then I'll show you the final result. And here is my final project. I made this into a simple envelope backed pillow. This finished at 14 inches. You could definitely make it about 16 as well and have plenty of room around. But I'm just super excited at how this turned out. So don't forget, down in the description is the link for the free pattern. And I would love to see what you make. I hope you enjoy it. Happy sewing.